Hey, I'm Circle Strafe, and welcome to episode 11 of the Dante's Inferno Rundown. In this episode, we're going to be meeting the Giants, and then delving down into the final circle of the Inferno, the Circle of the Treacherous. Whilst heading to the final circle, everything becomes dark. It is icy cold, and strong winds batter the two poets. The pair of them strain to see, so rely heavily on their hearing. Dante makes out the silhouette of many tall towers arranged in a circle. He turns to Virgil and asks him which city this is. Peer again beyond this mist, Dante. You will see not towers, but giants encircling the ninth level of this pit. The poets edge towards the giants, and Dante's fear grows. Dante blesses heaven for not allowing the giants to breed on earth. Virgil starts identifying the giants, first pointing to Nimrod. Nimrod was one of the kings of ancient Babylon, responsible for the building of the Tower of Babel. Babel was so ambitious in size that it almost reached heaven. God himself struck the tower down for its arrogance. The breaking of the tower split the languages of man into thousands of dialects and tongues. Nimrod himself cannot speak. He is only capable of mumbling incoherent nothings. His punishment is to never again understand and never again be understood. Virgil says that Nimrod thoroughly deserves his punishment for breaking up the many peoples of the world into different cultures, nations, and races. The poets continue until they reach another, much larger giant. This giant is chained up in massive restraint, looped five times around his body. Virgil names him as Ephialtes, the giant who challenged the gods to war. Dante asks Virgil when they will see Briareus. Briareus was another giant who challenged heaven. Virgil states, Antonius is close ahead. He will help us enter the ninth circle. And the giant of which you speak is far away and far more terrifying. Ephialtes tries to escape his bonds at the name of Briareus. His fear causes an earthquake. As the two approach Antaeus, Virgil explains the giant's origin. Dante learns that he ate lions and that, had he been born at the time of the giants, the giants would have won their war against the gods. Virgil flatters Antaeus' strength and deeds convincing the giant to deposit them in the next circle. The giant gently picks up our two poets in his palm. Dante is terrified that Antaeus is going to hurt him, but the giant crouches down and places them carefully and softly into the deepest part of the inferno. Dante cannot find the words to talk about the horrors of the Ninth Circle, but he tries his best to describe this new scene. He asks the Muses to bless his words so that they may appear true, however coarse and rugged that they are. This is the final level of the Inferno, the realm of the foulest sinners, the treacherous. Walking underneath Antaeus' feet, Dante hears a soul cry to watch where he steps. He looks down and sees before him that he has stood on an enormous frozen lake, the Cositus. This frozen lake is the dead center and core of the universe. It appears like glass and is almost mirrored, becoming the metaphor that after Dante's long journey, he has learned to not only look at the evil in others, but perhaps the evil within himself. Standing inside the ice are sinners, shivering, chattering their teeth and crying. Dante realizes that there are four rings to this circle. 
The first ring is named Cana, after the biblical murderer Cain. This is where traitors to kin are punished. Dante sees two sinners so closely packed that their hair is conjoined. They are squashed breast to breast. Dante asks them who they are, but they mostly ignore him, butting heads with one another instead. Another sinner nearby begins to talk. He identifies the two as the Bicencio brothers, who killed one another over politics. He says that there are no two sinners more fit for Cana than this pair. The sinner states himself as Commissione di Pazzi, condemned for killing kinsmen for political power. He denies his punishment is just by claiming the evil of his kinsmen. The poets continue moving and enter Antonora, the second ring of this circle. It is named for Antonor of Troy, who unsealed his home city gates for the Greeks. This ring is devoted to traitors against their homelands or countries. Dante accidentally kicks the face of a sinner. The sinner pipes up and yells in sorrow to Dante, asking why he must attack him so. Dante asks for a brief moment of time from Virgil, as he hopes to clear up the misunderstanding. He roughly asks the sinner who he is. The soul replies a mirrored question, asking Dante who he is. Dante explains that he is a living man and he will grant the sinner great fame. The soul seems disinterested and just wants to be left alone. Dante grabs the soul by his hair and yells at the man to identify himself or he will continue to keep pulling the man's hair until there is none left. The soul is still defiant and not intimidated. Dante, finally demonstrating his complete contempt for the inhabitants of hell, pulls out a tuft of the sinner's hair and the soul screams loudly in pain. Another soul nearby yells to him by name to shut up. The now healer's soul is named Boccia degli Abati. Boccia betrayed the Florentine Guelphs on the field of battle. Dante threatens to tarnish Boccia's name if he doesn't answer his questions, but Boccia still remains defiant. Boccia merely asks if Dante will also tarnish the names of a few other souls as well. Dante is angry and he moves on, followed by Virgil. The poets next come across another pair of sinners. The face of one is biting tightly into the back of the other. As always, Dante wants them identified. The biting soul in reply begins to speak. He lifts his teeth from the other sinner and wipes his mouth on the lower soul's hair. The sinner says that recounting his story makes him weep, but if it exposes his betrayer, he will gladly continue. Ugolino was the magistrate of Pisa, and he made some tough decisions in life. One of those decisions was to cede Pisa to a hostile neighboring city, which some considered betrayal. Ugolino found himself exiled from Pisa, and Archbishop Ruggieri tempted him back under false pretenses. The Archbishop locked Ugolino and his children into a Pisan tower called the Eagle Tower, but known afterwards as the Hunger Tower. They were kept there for a while as regular prisoners. As the days of imprisonment rolled on, the inmates continued to expect their normal supply of food. However, on one fateful day, instead of the guards bringing food, Ugolino heard men nailing the door to the tower shut. His insides turned at the sound and he went silent, unable to speak to his scared children. A few more days went by and one of the sons finally succumbed to hunger. He lied dead at the feet of his father. Then another son died, and another, yet Ugolino still did not speak. Eventually, after all of his children were dead and Ugolino had gone totally blind from the hunger, he called out to his children, realizing finally that they were gone. Ugolino states that fasting had more force than grief. This suggests he either died of starvation or died feasting on his own children. Dante expresses grief that Pisa, a land of great scandal, is yet unpunished on the earth. The poets move on to the third ring of Circle Nine.
That's it, thanks for watching. A huge thank you to all of our subscribers for helping us to dash past our 1000 subscriber milestone. Your support means so much to us. If you're new to this channel or new to this series, click here to start episode 1, or click here to see another series we're doing about mythical creatures. And we'll see you in the next video. Toodles!